Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this roundtable talk sponsored by IWP. Uh, tonight, we'll be hearing from IWP's very own Dr. Chris Harmon and Professor Aaron Danis regarding a topic uh, on lessons learned 50 years after the 1972 Munich massacre. So I will, without further ado, I will hand it over to our two professors. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Well, good evening. Um, although um, yesterday marked a holiday for Americans, it was a hard anniversary for many others around the world. 50 years on, we're gonna remember the Munich massacre uh, of athletes at the Olympic Games and consider some of the lessons perhaps that might uh, be proffered by that tragedy. Um, on the 5th of September in 1972, eight very well-trained and armed men climbed over a fence around the Olympic Village and broke into the Israeli team residence. They killed two athletes that were courageous enough to actually fight back against such well-armed men. And then they took nine hostages. One of those, uh, interestingly, was an American named David Berger, an Ohio man uh, for whom there's a, a memorial now in Cleveland. For the Palestinians, uh, one purpose was to compel the release of 236 named terrorists who were in jails, mostly Israeli jails, although there was an interesting inclusion of two of the famous Germans from the Red Army faction, and that is Ulrike Meinhof and Andreas Bader. Uh, the larger purpose uh, for the team doing this was to announce the Palestinian cause. In one very immediate sense, they said it was because they had no team at the games. Uh, more widely, of course, they wanted a homeland and said that they'd been excluded from that. So uh, when government didn't yield, then armed German police came to the residence and the terror team uh, got nervous and jumpy and demanded a flight out. And uh, they wanted to take all the hostages with them naturally. Negotiations for this event were conducted in a very smooth and professional way by a man called Isa at the moment. His real name was Mohammed Masala. He was a bilingual, he was a cool head. He always had his hand around a grenade. And um, this is interesting. That summer he had served temporarily as one of the architects of the new Olympic village. He'd been doing his reconnaissance. So after a very long day uh, about which uh, the details are many and bloody, uh, this all ends at Feldbruck, which was a nearby military airport. A German air crew and pilots uh, and police died. Uh, all the hostages died. Several Palestinian captors died. No one thought that the German Republic had handled this well. Uh, they were the victim state, but they became the subject of fierce critique. For now, for this anniversary, it's interesting to note that the Bavarian and Berlin governments have been negotiating with the families of the victims about a compensation package. Uh, and apparently there's a, at least a preliminary agreement about that. So what are the lessons for all this? Aaron and I are gonna try to take a look at them well, with you and, and see what your views are. I think for me, one of the first is that terrorism is distinguished by its lust for media and it gets it. Terrorism works more often than not. Uh, the Munich event is, I think, one of the most important in modern history, following, uh, falling between the murder of the Austro-Hungarian air in Sarajevo in 1914 and September 11th, 2001. Uh, the operatives of 5 September 72 were a Palestinian liberation organization section named code, uh, code named Black September. And that of course was a time two years prior to this attack uh, in which Jordan it, uh, expelled the troublesome PLO from its territory. PLO Press was proud of the way all of this unfolded. They got what they wanted. One in-house media organ announced that compared to this operation they'd just done in Munich, uh, 
Uh, they could not have even been upstaged by a bomb at the White House, the death of Mao Zedong, or a landmine in the Vatican. And I think they're right about that. The top PLO commanders were involved, and their chief planner was Abu Daud, or Mohammed Uday. He took proud credit for all this in a 99 book and also in a 2005 interview from Damascus. And he can be found on video as a very old man speaking in reasonably good English about how Munich succeeded and its news penetrated into 500 million households and brought them the word Palestine. Um, Munich shows us immediately how the academic relativists are wrong about this term terrorism. It's not just a slur. It can't be dismissed uh, as a word so, quote, value laden that it's some kind of mush. The terrorists know what they're doing and they know it's terrorism. And it's not guerrilla war because guerrilla war, as you know, uh, can be legal and morally defensible. A limited amount of learning on this occasion, still with the subject of media, was by the media. Uh, that is, they were embarrassed by their own heavy coverage of all this. Uh, it was an atrocity and they felt perhaps they might have exploited it. A live TV coverage thoroughly compromised the German police attempts to take down the terrorists. This was a, one of the more perverse things that happened. The terrorists inside the residence holding the hostages recognized that they were on live television and they could see that on their own TV screens, which forced, of course, the Germans to call off any attempt at, at rescue. Um, the mainstream media then dealt with this later with a considerable amount of introspection, and they actually tried to do something about codes, self-regulation of a media code for proper coverage of terrorism. I don't know where the major media organizations stand on this today, uh, because there's almost no interest in that topic. But for some years after Munich, there was. A second lesson that at least I draw is about terrorist internationalism. Since uh, 68, at least, the Palestine Liberation Organization went international, uh, and many other groups did too, and it makes sense. Um, ideologically, um, country boundaries just don't mean very much if you're a communist, if you're an anarchist, if you're a Salafist. Uh, even for nationalists like the Palestinians, there are such obvious operational advantages to be had, always good media, um, and safe havens, of course, are critical for a group's training. Uh, in this case, in, in, in this case, uh, this team trained in Libya and Lebanon both. Uh, for transit, three of the terrorists came in via Yugoslavia, which was a springboard for many radical groups in that era. Uh, Belgrade has a big PLO mission at the time and a record of supporting uh, the militants. Uh, Black September took advantage of lack of lax security uh, in Europe. And then afterwards, the three surviving terrorists were evacuated to Libya, once again, an international player. The bodies of the dead terrorists were also shipped there and treated as heroes by the Qaddafi regime. Uh, mission planner Abu Daud took refuge somewhere in Eastern Europe, but I'm not able to find out exactly where. Many of the Warsaw Pact countries were supporting uh, PLO. Uh, and one mission planner, Hassan Salome, uh, is thought to have worked his angles on this mission from a East Berlin flat. Uh, so terrorist internationalism emerges from all this as an incredibly important subject. Uh, Aaron and I have both been uh, fond over the time of the State Department report called Patterns of Global Terrorism which the title of which captures nicely the problem. Uh, it's been renamed since Country Reports on Terrorism, which, which loses a little bit of that one flavor, but there's no question that it's an international phenomenon we're, we're worried about. A third point uh, to bring out um, is that one can have a pattern, uh, a certain amount of general warnings and still suffer a major lapse in security. Um, all events have to worry now about security. And of course, that sounds so obvious. But if so, 
what just happened in Chautauqua, New York. The BBC said uh, rather quickly in a one-liner uh, that Salman Rushdie had for the past year strongly opposed kind of cloaking of him in, with security. And maybe that's true. Not dissimilarly, in this case, in 72, uh, Germany had general warnings. For example, there'd been PLO and Black September attacks around Europe, London, Rome, Germany, Switzerland. Um, but Germany willfully opposed security for its own purposes. Um, they knew they were dealing with risks, but they wanted a good image. They actually hired a psychologist who wrote up an elaborate report indicating a whole series of possible things that could be dangerous to the games as they proceeded. One of the scenarios created for them in advance was almost exactly what did happen with the Black September team on the 5th of September of 72. And even when the men climbed over the fence into the village, they were seen by German postal workers who dutifully reported this, uh, but nothing was done. Germany was, as you know, a, a liberal republic. And in 72, their greatest concern uh, was to be seen as liberal, to banish the specter of, of 1933 to 45. And the themes of the games were about serenity and good cheer and so forth. And they ordained a minimum of security. In fact, policy ordained that there would be no visible uniform security uh, to speak of uh, at all. Um, there were no special armed teams in waiting, things we now take for granted, right? Um, a pickup team of state Bavarian police was there. They were rushed to the crisis. They had no appropriate training. They had inadequate weapons. They had no serious uh, tactical plans. Um, several of those assigned confessed that they were unwilling to give their lives for these foreign athletes. And one group that was key to the mission of the evacuation of the whole group, if negotiation succeeded, one group voted and decided to abort their mission. Uh, lesson four was about then what uh, armed security might look like. Germany responded after 72 in a very impressive way. They trained a superb counter-terrorist team, so-called GSG-9 civilians from their border police. Uh, Israel had offered to help during the crisis and they were turned down by the government. In this case now, the Germans took counsel from Israeli specialists who themselves had the advantage of consultation with things like the British Special Air Service. GSG-9 became so adept, in fact, and pioneered so many useful tactics that they became instructors for people like the Americans who had not yet developed these special teams. The German teams became a uh, marvel, actually. Uh, their squads did a specially impressive takedown in October 1977 of a Lufthansa jet that had been kidnapped and taken to Mogadishu. Uh, so after that kind of teamwork developed in a number of countries, you saw a different change in, in the terrorist profile. It began to be seen as much less profitable to take large numbers of hostages and try to get away in an airplane or similar operations. In short, security became really serious. Security had billed out at $2 million in 72 for the games, million with an M. By the time of Greece, a few sessions later, the Olympics cost about $2 billion, or B, it, it certainly would be what it would be now. Uh, a staggering change in, in modern times. Um, the last of the five points I, I, I want to mention um, is uh, to focus in on Israel's response. Uh, Professor Danis is going to remind us how in, in these days of of security threats, the national governments are racking and stacking various threats. It's extremely hard to do. Um, in this time, governments ranked counterterrorism exceedingly low on almost all governments have felt that way. And most of what they planned for was not what we would call counterterrorism, which can suggest a kind of offensive spirit. It was really more like anti-terrorism and almost purely defensive. Um, the, um, the U.S. was living, for example, 
uh, under a kind of executive order against assassination. And so even when a team or planners uh, had a record of attacks against Western targets or other targets or even Americans, the United States was not willing to, to, go, to, to go after those particular uh, individuals. Uh, many years after the Munich massacre, I did a long study for uh, the congressman I was working for. Uh, and it was an argument in part as well. And it was an argument for armed uh, retaliation and reaction. And we even raised the question of preemption. Uh, Jim Corder of the House Armed Services Committee ran with that article and it came out in a Heritage Foundation journal by a weird coincidence uh, just uh, shortly after the uh, Libya bombing by President Reagan which was a, a retaliatory action and a self-defensive one uh, against a long pattern of events from there. But our reservations even after Mr. Reagan's bold action remain. Our reservations were very powerful and they, and they, they remain. Uh, the, some of these were documented by uh, Richard Schultz of the Tufts School uh, in a remarkable article called Showstoppers, which really struck me in early 04, especially because many of these showstoppers were in the Pentagon, uh, in, in, in the homes, <laughs> in the minds uh, of our senior military officers. It wasn't a problem of, you know, left wing pressure saying don't retaliate. Uh, it was our own senior military command with its reservations, good or not, against a retaliation. And if you can forgive just one final sort of memory on this question of uh, American national reservations in this, uh, it was interesting to, to go out in the late 90s. I went out to a Missouri school, which was known for pretty conservative politics and a very hard commitment to American national interests. An article had appeared in a good journal uh, suggesting that it might be time to consider assassinating terror group leaders abroad. I asked the students if they thought that would be a good idea. And it was interesting that not one of them was willing to speak for that option. Uh, today, of course, uh, everything has seemingly changed. People who would describe themselves as very liberal people uh, are quite willing to see that kind of retaliatory action. And they describe it as self-defense, which I think in fact is accurate. So 9-11 helps account for a lot of change and it accounts for a lot of change in global terrorism. And with Israel especially, I think that there's something about the Israeli behavior after this action in 72, which is certainly contributive to that pattern of change in which more and more force was used as a matter of counterterrorism, as against other tools of policy. Uh, the so-called Wrath of God teams were dispatched by Israel and by specifically by Prime Minister Golda Meir to the European countries to hunt down those who had done Munich and others who were related to those organizations but had not actually been um, at Munich. And they killed eight, nine, 12, something like that. Uh, there was another effort by a military unit, uh, the uh, General Staff Reconnaissance Unit, uh, which, which took a, a boats into Beirut in a seaborne raid in 73 and attacked a PLO headquarters quite directly. So there's a change that's occurring in general views about counterterrorism in the, in the wake of Munich, and Israel was a, a leader of, of that change. And with that, I would turn over to Professor Aaron Davis. Thank you, Chris. Um, my portion of this is going to talk about the implications of Munich for U.S. policy, U.S. intelligence, U.S. response um, in the wake of the Munich attacks. Now, as a bit of context uh, for people not who don't remember the Nixon administration, mm -hmm. I have to admit when Munich happened, I was only 10 years old, so I have to go into the Wayback Machine for this. Um, you know, during the Nixon administration, the the idea that um, counterterrorism would be on the, the president's plate um, was an idea that was uh, suppressed quite a bit. The president's advisors worked hard to keep him out of the international terrorism fray, seeing the problem as a minor threat when compared to Vietnam, 
dealing with Russia, China, and arms control agreements, or um, trying to achieve Middle East peace. Yes, they were trying to do that back then too. Um, the terrorism problem was seen mostly through those kind of international relations lenses, as we will see. Um, even something like Munich um, was eliciting responses. What do we talk about with the Russians? What do we talk about um, to the Chinese when we look at these problem sets? Aircraft hijackings, which impacted the U.S. domestically in the days before metal detectors were deployed and federal air marshals um, were, on, were put on flights, were seen as the primary, um, one of the primary um, domestic terrorism problems as uh, commercial flights were hijacked to Cuba on what seemed like a weekly basis. Uh, there used to be a joke, if you want to go to Cuba, take a flight to Miami, right? Because it's probably a good chance it's going to be diverted. Um, with the Munich hostage taking, Nixon's advisors would continue to fence him off from the public response to international terrorism, but he would play a role in changing U.S. counterterrorism policy, which was in its infancy at the time and largely internally focused with groups like the Weather Underground, Symbionese Labor Liberation Army, and other groups. Um, but uh, behind the scenes, President Nixon would be quite involved. Looking at the intelligence and warning aspects of the Munich massacre, um, on the morning of September 5th, 1972, the top secret president's um, daily brief, or PDB, as it's still called, was delivered to the White House for President Nixon, who often did not read it, um, but left it to his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, to digest and organize for him. Eventually, it would make its way to the president in a stack of documents with um, the National Security Advisor's notes and uh, comments on the top. It's very difficult to tell in hindsight how much um, President Nixon actually read of the PDB. Some people said he did read some of it, others didn't think he read any of it. Um, that may have varied you know, over time and based on his interest in the topic. I think there's enough um, evidence to show that he did read it from time to time. Um, the PDB on the morning of September 5th contained the following short paragraph called Late Item. It was on the first page of the PDB. And it just said this in three sentences. Early this morning, Arab guerrillas entered the quarters of the Israeli um, Olympic team in Munich, killed at least one occupant, and are holding as many as 20 Israeli athletes hostage within the building. Press reports indicate the guerrillas are demanding the release of Arab prisoners in Israeli jails in return for the lives of their hostages. Prime Minister Golda Meir is, is holding an emergency meeting of her cabinet to discuss is, Israel's response. Um, very bare bones, no mention, as um, Dr. Harmon mentioned, of a U.S. dual citizen being held amongst them. It's unclear when Nixon would find out um, that the, one of the uh, victims was an American. And it was probably left pretty bare bones because, as he also mentioned, the games were being telecast live via satellite for the first time. So the world could see things as they happened, including the hostage taking and the events around that. Um, one would think with only one American involved that it may not capture the president's attention um, in a way that an aircraft full of um, a hijacked aircraft full of Americans um, may, may grab his attention. Um, but as we have heard, events move rapidly on the ground. And Berger was killed early the next day in the botched German rescue attempt. And as a side note, President Nixon would later order the U.S. Air Force to send an aircraft to return his body to the United States. So he, he eventually became aware there was an American citizen in that. Um, Looking at the, um, the written record and also the, the tapes that President Nixon um, had made for, through a recording uh, system that he had in the Oval Office, um, a number of things come clear. Um, at 1035 on the evening of September 5th, which would be about 430 in the morning um, in Germany, President's Deputy, National, uh, Deputy Assistant for National Security Affairs, Alexander Haig, called President Nixon and informed him, quote, We've got some very shocking news on the Israeli thing. President asked how many hostages were killed, and Haig responded, all killed. Oh my, Nixon exclaimed, clearly surprised. And just as a little bit more context, earlier in the evening, there were actually press reports that all the hostages had been rescued. These were erroneous press reports that had been put out 
And thus, when the, when the real news that they'd all been killed, the exact 180 degree opposite, people were shocked. After some discussion, the president suggested, quote, under the circumstances, we ought to discuss with the Russians and do something. The whole world is going to be shocked by this. We've got to take it up out of interest. We are going to intervene in it, end quote. So right off the bat, he's talking about talking to the Russians on an event happening in Germany involving Palestinian terrorists. Ten minutes later, the president called um, Haig back and said, quote, this isn't, of course, a very big thing. You could talk to Secretary of State Rogers about this. The United States should indicate that they will break diplomatic relations with countries that harbor any sorts of guerrilla groups. Hell, what do we care about Lebanon? Think that we have to be awfully tough. I want you to run that by a couple of people. Any nation that harbors or gives sanctuary to these international outlaws will all be cut off, will be cut off of all economic support. Obviously, Lebanon, Jordan's another, end quote. Thus, U.S. counterterrorism policy began to evolve on the spot. Um, in other words, countries that give sanctuary to terrorists will be given, there'll be economic sanctions. The PDB for 6 September had a short article about possible Israeli military responses to the death of its athletes, something that Nixon had ruminated on the evening prior while talking to Haig. Using the term fedayin, which Dr. Harmon had mentioned because the word terrorist wasn't in common use then, um, the PDB stated that installations in Lebanon and states who harbored them were expected to be on the target list. Two days later, the PDB carried a special appendix called fedayin terrorists, thus mashing the two terms together. This focused on the Black September organization, its terrorist operations, and shared identity with Yasser Arafat's PLO. That was the extent of PD, PDB reporting on the Munich attack and its immediate aftermath. So as you can see, there was no warning article and uh, the, the follow-up was, was pretty bare bones. Concerning presidential priorities, a review of both Nixon's and Henry Kissinger's memoirs from this time frame show no mention of the Munich massacre. The focus in both books is on Vietnam, Soviet Union, and China. Kissinger does have a chapter on the September 1970 Palestinian crisis in Jordan, um, which, as Dr. Harmon mentioned, would be the genesis of the Black September organization. Based on this, one would think that the attack had a little impact on the fledgling U.S. counterterrorism policy at the time, but that belief is wrong. On September 6th, the White House recording system that President Nixon had installed reveals in an all-day running discussion from about, well, at least a half-day running discussion from about 8 a.m. through about mid-afternoon with Kissinger, Rogers, and Haig and other senior aides participating, um, a discussion concerning the attack and possible policy responses. Much of the initial discussion concerned possible Israeli responses in the region which could entangle the United States. And indeed, Israel launched airstrikes within days against PLO positions in Lebanon and Syria and sent a punitive expedition into Lebanon a week later. It also roiled domestic politics with Israeli supporters in Congress. And as you, and when you, you know, read through the transcripts or listen to the tapes, which are available at the, the Nixon archives on the internet, you can actually listen to the discussion. A lot of talk about, you know, what do the Russians think about this and should we talk to China about this? So they're always thinking about the internet, bigger international context. The first thing the administration did was to announce on September 8th the formation of an intelligence committee to deter international terrorism in cooperation with the intelligence services of other countries, friendly countries. The committee would be made up of the State Department, CIA, and FBI officials. Little is known about the committee, but as of July 1972, the CIA only had a few analysts studying terrorism full time and no regular intelligence production on, on terrorism. This would eventually change. So lesson number one, U.S. intelligence warning was basically non-existent and intelligence support was minimal. Terrorism was not an important topic to the president and there were few analysts covering the topic full time. According to former State Department terrorism analyst and author Dennis Blachinsky, in November 1972, two months after Munich massacre, the CIA started writing a weekly product 
on the global terrorism threat with input from the FBI and other agencies. One could conclude this was an output of the above mentioned intelligence committee. And if you actually go into the, the CIA documents, you, you find that those linkages. So um, there was at least one direct output was that. And this weekly um, newsletter would run for years and then eventually would be turned into another publication called the Terrorism Review by the CIA. On the policy side, um, Tim Naftali, the author of The Secret American History of, of American Counterterrorism, excellent book, which was done for the 9-11 Commission, uh, points out that Kissinger saw Israeli overreaction, not further terrorism, as the main threat and decided to try and slow the Israeli reaction by denouncing international terrorism during United Nations visit the following week after the, after the uh, massacre. In his return to Washington, he also proposed to President Nixon the formation of what he intended to be a largely symbolic organization called the Cabinet Committee to Combat Terrorism. That's a mouthful for you, the CCCT, which was created primarily to mollify the American Jewish lobby, if you listen to the tapes and the discussion in the, in the, um, in the Oval Office. Nixon liked the idea of this, of this committee, but wanted it to have more teeth. Quote, we should have got... We have got to have contingency plans for hijacking, for kidnapping, for all sorts of things that could happen around here, he stated. The president followed up the discussion by issuing execution memos on September 25th, 1972, to Secretary Rogers of State Department as the CCCT chairman and to what we call the interagency, all the different cabinet level agencies to support it. The CCCT was supposed to be filled by the senior members of the administration, such as the Secretaries of State, Treasury, Defense, Transportation, the Attorney General, the Acting FBI Director, CIA Director, National Security Advisor, among others. There were others involved as well. Ultimately, Kissinger got his way and the CCCT only met once in its five years of existence. And that was on October 2nd, just a few weeks after the, the Munich massacre but it spawned a working group on terrorism, a work, which was more at the kind of a mid and lower level um, within these agencies. Um, and this consisted of mid-level agency of representatives, and it was led by an ambassador, and this met bi-weekly and met hundreds of times. There's a long record of their memos that you can look at. And um, the working group um, basically was a, um, a precursor to the current National Security Council Counterterrorism Security Group, or CSG, which has been around since the Reagan administration. The Working Group on Terrorism tried to address persistent bureaucratic hurdles as new agencies were brought into the counterterrorism policy process, complicating an already fraught interagency um, cooperation. So they added other agencies as needed um, but they were, they were struggling because it was largely a mid-level organization with not a lot of high-level um, input. So lesson number two, the interagency working groups are a necessity and can work if given the opportunity and they have senior level um, focus. I was reviewing some of the working group minutes um, from a meeting that happened in late 1970, or excuse me, in June 1976, the week before the U.S. Bicentennial celebration. And you can see in this document all the similar things that you see in similar me me meeting minutes that you see today. You see a domestic um, threat brief. You see foreign threat briefs. Um, there's a sizable lift list of interagency partners and actions they're taking. So what, we've, what we're doing now has um, its feet back in the uh, 1970s during the Nixon administration. Finally, um, on the, in the looking at international diplomacy, um, President Nixon's biggest counterterrorism gains came in the area of international diplomacy arena, the international diplomacy arena, with four international agreements uh, concluded, which largely focused on the hijacking epidemic of the 1970s. Um, Nixon's other major contribution to U.S. counterterrorism policy was the almost accidental creation of the quote no, or the so-called no concessions policy. This was in response to a hostage taking incident in Khartoum, Sudan the following year. Again, Black September organization was responsible for the attack in, in Khartoum, which resulted in the death of two US senior diplomats, the ambassador and Chargé d'Affaires. 
Um, Nixon, while responding to a reporter's question at a press conference at the height of the crisis, stated spontaneously that the U.S. would do everything it could to gain the release of U.S. hostages overseas, but not pay ransom or give in to blackmail. The two U.S. diplomats were subsequently shot and killed along with a Belgian diplomat, and a policy was born that actually remains a pillar of U.S. counterterrorism policy today, no concessions. And this also gets back at the point that, you know, you don't put the president in front of a microphone uh, in the, you know, answering questions about these international counterterrorism events um, because you get this kind of spontaneous response or gut response that can, um, can that can tie you to future policy. So lesson number three, um, the international counterterrorism efforts are very important and long lasting. The, the four documents that were signed, which dealt primarily with aviation issues, aviation conventions are still in effect today and are still um, effective in reducing um, armed aircraft hijackings, uh, which was a, a, you know, as I mentioned, the primary problem during the 1970s and into the 1980s um, less so today, um, thanks to things like metal detectors and, um, you know, security, hardened security at airports. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to stop and we will take Q&A. Yeah. And we have a number of additional topics we can discuss if you like. Over to you, whatever, whatever you wish to speak about. And, and, and it's not necessary that it be a question. You're quite quite able to just make comments. We, we have yeah. a few ringers in the in the audience here, so I'd like to we'd like to hear from them. So, one Doug? of the things I found most interesting on that kind of focused on that was the uh, the whole uh, <clears throat> the whole uh, flavor of the Olympics uh, was very important to to the German political machine because this was their first opportunity post. 36 Olympics to show they were a different country, a different type of people. And so they were pushing very hard to be, uh, you know, a very peaceful brotherly uh, flavor for the event. And we see, you know, indirectly it led to tragedy. So I'm glad you were bringing that point up. I thought it was very, very important. Yeah. To there look were, at the whole atmosphere of the event. There were a number of, of comments at the time uh, by uh, by Jews or representatives of Israel studying this from afar or being up close um, about the remarkable effect it had to see hostages with their hands bound being led along by gunmen and ordered to go someplace they weren't sure about in terms of destinations. Uh, and so those... Uh, those uh, memories all flooded back for everyone. And it was, uh, you can see why the Germans took the posture they did on security. You can see why it was fiercely criticized afterwards. Um, but it was a especially horrific uh, event in that way for the state of Israel. Um, it was uh, also, of course, we didn't emphasize this, but you all know it's obvious the the games are founded based on the notion of kind of a human brotherhood, the notion that almost any differences can be put aside in order to stage a game which celebrates uh, some divine themes in the old days and certainly uh, general humanity. And so it was an especially cruel place to, to conduct this kind of terrorism. Yeah. yeah, and I think your your point too, I think you mentioned it, you know, it's come out in the last few years is that the German government buried a lot of what happened in their own internal reviews. Some of those have leaked out. Um, some of it has been, re you know, released on purpose by the German government. And it's it's not a, a pretty thing because it was something that the Germans were trying to avoid from the get go. There's even one more chapter of that before we turn to, to Dr. Strusen's point. Um, the three who were captured after the first and Fellbrook catastrophe in which uh, many died and uh, uh, a number of the terrorists were killed. Those who were captured were put in a German jail. Five, six, seven weeks later, there was a new hijacking conducted of another airliner. And the, and the, and the price to be paid was the freedom of those three. 
Uh, not only did it work, that is, not only were they flown out to Libya, there were rumors afterwards that in some ways the Germans had actually been collaborating with that to get those three murderers out of their territory. Uh, and uh, they finally pressed one of the top special forces people on this later, uh, who didn't disavow that this might have happened. So there's a kind of cloud over that, but it really uh, is another reminder of how horrible it was for the Germans and also how much they underperformed uh, in, in, in this case. It was a ready lesson for all governments, although even the Americans were slow to take that lesson. Dr. Struess. Uh, on the point of German reaction and German management, uh, of course, Willy Brandt was chancellor, and Gunther Guillaume, who was one of his closest advisors, was an East German agent. So it seems to me that it's quite possible that East German intelligence had something to do with the way that the West German government handled the situation. Um, second point, going you know, more, 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 what our, our friend said, um, it's worth pointing out that a lot of that live TV coverage was done by uh, reporters from ABC Sports because they, were, they, because they were there. And I think it's, isn't it possible that the fact that they were sportscasters affected the way that they covered events because they're, they're used to emphasizing individual achievements, individual actions? I, I would just say this. I remember Jim McKay and, and you know, you can find, you can find your whole life on YouTube nowadays. You can find some of that coverage on YouTube and it's covered in some of the documentaries. And I would say, if anything, he, it was a very human response, right? And he was one of the first people to say, you know, that the you know that the initial reports were wrong, and that in fact all the hostages were dead, and you could just see the pain on his face. I'm not sure you would have gotten that from professional, you know, newscasters, but somebody who does sports and the. You know, the, that, that milieu, I think you got a different response out of him. He, he said, uh, they're gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Uh, Golda Meir was uh, more sober. Uh, when they brought her the news that all the hostages had been saved, they brought her a bottle of champagne and she didn't drink it. She said, wait, let's, let's wait to see. Uh, yeah, the other thing I was going to mention is a remark that I know that you and I, and possibly Dr. Tierney, heard the late Charles Lichtenstein uh, make in uh, September of 2001, after the uh, after the after 9/11, when he said that in his um, you know 50 plus years of involvement in U.S. national security, that he had never known an administration that took terrorism seriously. The Nixon examples that Aaron's explored so thoroughly intrigue me in that way. We do, we do see him as above all very likely to be very tough. But the book by Naftali, which Professor Danish was first to recommend to me, and his comments today kind of underscore that, that even Nixon, however serious he was, uh, ranked this just low, very low in his concerns. It's also, there's an interesting kind of disjunction between things I said based on later books and articles and, and some considerations I've done on East Bloc support for the PLO and President Nixon's reaction. Uh, his, first, his first phone call would be to a government in Moscow, which I believe since 1956 had been supporting these people. Fatah's newspaper in English about 1978 or nine showed a picture from 1956, five, six, of Abu Ayyad, who helped run this operation, Yasser Arafat. The faces are famous and Im Im impossible to miss despite the age difference. Uh, and, uh, and so in 1956, uh, Fatah was already in the Soviet bloc, in this case in Czechoslovakia. Uh, 
as a student union group. Uh, the further the, the real military aid wouldn't start till much later, but that's how far back the investment of the Soviet Union went into these young men from Palestine. What, what's interesting is you know we always talk about this. Um, you know why was the Soviet Union never added to the state sponsor list? Right there were there was the terror network, uh, Claire Sterling's book, and so forth. Um, there are two national intelligence estimates that were declassified during the Reagan administration, and one in 81 and one in 86, that look at this question. And they both say that in general, yes, the, the Soviets support revolutionary movements around the world, but they couldn't find a smoking gun that linked them directly to support to specific terrorist groups or attacks. Um, but it was more of a broad-based support. Now, we know for a fact now, after the fact, that East Germany was knee deep in support of these groups, particularly the Red Army faction and Carlos, um, you know, the Jackal, you know, Ilya Tremira Sanchez. Um, but and, you know, they had RAF folks coming to East Germany for training in their in their military camps. Um, you know what the tie there is to the Soviets. Some of that may still be in Soviet archives someplace, but it probably explains plus the, you know, the Soviet Union's importance as a as a. You know, in all these international arm agreements, why the U.S. never went that far and the Reagan administration never went that far. But there are, the, it's, the first estimate in 81 is a little bit more strident. By, nine, by 86, it is toned down quite a bit. What other interests have you in the, uh, in the, in the operation or its aftermath or lessons to be, to be learned? I have a question on the aftermath. Uh, you compared it to the 9-11 to the attacks. And I'll be very honest, I don't see the consequences of the Munich attack to be in that category. Certainly not in the category of the assassination of the Archduke. However, I'm trying to. I want to. I wonder if you could elaborate somewhat on whether or not you believe the consequences were on the terrorist side or the counter side, both or neither. Yeah, I think my 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 text as as, as I worked it out uh, says that uh, the Munich case is is one of the most important in modern history and falls between the two groups, uh, the two operations that you've you've mentioned. And so I hope I haven't overstated. Uh, I might have. I'm I'm very compelled, uh, Professor Tierney, by the creation of the state, the Palestine Authority. I think it's one of the most remarkable things of our lifetime that uh, something like a strategy of terrorism could have been used so, so um, uh, successfully. The creation of a state, which today is, of course, divided between Gaza and, and West Bank and the PA and Hamas. Um, but the movement by Mr. Arafat, which begins early, formally opens in 64, does yield results. It yields a, 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 a proto-government and then a, a government. And it's in control of a big piece of real estate today. And so in that case, terrorism was not just a media spectacle, not just something tactical. Um, it was uh, a, a, a responsible for the creation of a state. And I find that to be of immense consequence. And then secondly, what am I thinking when I, when I had said something which, which could be considered uh, extreme? Um, the lessons from this were all negative. The, the, that is the lessons from this were that terror is highly, highly successful thing, thing to do. FLN found this to be true in Algeria when they defeated a NATO uh, member, a nuclear power, former empire, a country with a seat on the Security Council called France, defeated by guerrilla and terrorist operations and very skillful politics. Right? And so when PLO uh, actually was studied, studied that result, 
uh, and uh, their ability then to make their own foray into the business of glo literally global terrorism, um, of which this is a, a, a prime example, uh, was a kind of symbol of the age that was coming. And, and, and it's a, for, a forebear of the, uh, the contemporary Salafists. Uh, it's a reflection back to the international anarchists who, by definition, were less organized than Yasser Arafat was. It's the problem with being an anarchist organization. Uh, but it had much more effect. The anarchist experience ends in really a kind of nihilism and the gradual arrest, aging out uh, and defeat of individuals. This operation we discussed today leads directly into the foundation of a state and into a pattern of modern behavior, which was inconceivable at one time and is now something we take for granted. I think part of that, too, is that subsequently, um, you know, Fatah backs off. The, you know, the BSO is largely taken out by the Israelis. Mm -hmm. The PLO backs off of terrorism, but fosters splinter groups who see Yasser Arafat as being weak and not radical enough to include the Abu Nidal organization. And ultimately, Arafat looks mild compared to them. So they figure there's a guy we can deal with. We can't deal with the PLF, P, the PLF, the PLF, PGC, the ANO, all these spin out groups. Um, and even though what, what, what bothers me is, you know, finding out that the following year during the Khartoum uh, event that two U.S. diplomats are killed and there's an intercepted phone call that indicates that that um, Arafat directly ordered their their death. They were taken apparently to the basement and shot. Um, they were at the Saudi ambassador's residence where there was this event going on. Um, yet that gets papered over kind of down the road as well. Um, but, you know, when you look when you look moderate compared to everybody else, then people are willing to talk to you and uh, you just need some more radical splinter groups to make you look good. It's a good front operation. Uh, Doug. Well, first of all, I'm wondering, were those groups actually actually splinters or were they components of the PLO, which was an umbrella? But second, secondly, I think that, that it's it's interesting to note that. After 1967 and the death of uh, Nasser in 70, Arab nationalism was definitely uh, in, in, a, in a descent. Uh, <coughs> but, I'm sorry? It was the oxygen that gave life. Right. But, but PLO was always an Arab nationalist organization. And I submit that it's quite possibly their, their use of terrorism that permitted them to sustain that momentum. Clem. I don't know if uh, any, anyone is thinking or, pro or uh, uh, proffering this, but I, I think what the, uh, the, the great leap forward was for the terrorism was the fact that the Arab armies in 67 failed to uh, to accomplish what they promised the people, uh, the, the Arabs on the street. And so the next option was these, uh, these uh, kind of uh, amorphous groups that were, were showing success to the, to the Arabs on the street when the governments of, of the Middle East were unable to, to, to kind of meet their, their promises. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and especially at a, at a school like ours, I, I like to think about the wider aspects of, of these, these problems. Uh, I've given a lot of thought to the situation with the Kurds who outnumber the Palestinians by many times and have never had, properly speaking, uh, their own state. I think anybody here can and should appreciate the desire to have one's own state. Uh, and so what we've talked about today is one sliver of that struggle, which was uh, particularly morally and legally uh, reprehensible. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's within a context of a drive for, for, a, for a homeland. Uh, and the latter is something it's, it's not uh, difficult to be sympathetic with. One of the problems with this strategy, when you take a strategy like this, is the damage to 
others. So Black September isn't named because of something Israel did. Black September is named because a longtime patron of Palestinians, uh, Jordan, pushed them out after a lot of conflict. And the retaliatory actions in Europe and in Cairo that happened immediately were retaliations against the state of Jordan. Jordan lost a lot of good people. <laughs> and, you know, and then when you see any mass, any, any mass terrorist attack, that's the first thing that happens is all kinds of people <laughs> who weren't in any respect involved are suddenly dead or suddenly casualties. And so in this case, uh, there's a kind of a, a potential war between <laughs> two, two large groups of Palestinians, the Jordanians and, and, the, and, the, and the PLO. And, and that's just uh, the damage to the state of Jordan and its people uh, and the damage to Lebanon in another case. Uh, these are examples of, of the kind of, 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 of horrible things that happen in, in this kind of, when this kind of strategy is taken. I mean, in, in our day, uh, the most astonishing thing and uh, about um, about a lot of the Salafist terrorism is that uh, other Muslims are the victims of it. Eventually, after uh, 15 years of this, the State Department began to sort of reflect that in some of its rhetoric. But when you get news from a place like Pakistan of a bombing of a funeral or a mosque, it's the, usually the Shia who are the victims. Uh, and, and that's replicated in many scenes around the world. So uh, the, the strategy which we see in action today, which I've argued was highly successful, does extensive human damage, and it's often far wider than just any given target. Now, I guess that's the very nature of terrorism as opposed to focused guerrilla warfare, which can be conducted against armies and often is and often successfully and legally. I want to give uh, also a, a glass half full to Chris's glass half empty about the success of terrorism that from a U.S. policy perspective, this got the ball rolling, right? The U.S. prior to this was, was you know, had dealt with some international hijacking incidents. Most of the focus was, focus was domestic, but at least this got the ball rolling and attention on, we, on the fact that we need to do something about international terrorism. We need to have contingency plans. We need to have organizations in existence. The interagency needs to focus on this problem. And while the CCCT only met once, the working group met hundreds of times, and that would eventually you know, become other organizations. And some of the international policies um, the international conventions had long-term legs. They didn't necessarily yield immediate success, but ultimately they were part of a, an overall process to get other countries involved. Um, so I, that was my, that's my glass half full. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I don't want the three of us to dominate questions, but there's no questions elsewhere. Uh, the venue is the event. 11 people killed with respect is very short of thousands, if not millions, okay? The question here is, although uh, Aaron said that the uh, Munich uh, event uh, increased American alertness to terrorism, we've had over 12 Olympics since 1972. And that, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a single terrorist incident. I could be wrong. 1996 in what? Atlanta. In 1996 Atlanta, Eric Rudolph, the bombing of the 1996 oh. Atlanta. So we had it in our own backyard. Oh. Well, I forget things. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Still. 19 I mean, anymore. See, uh, see but, Clint but Eastwood's excellent Richard Jewell movie on that. There's not been a pattern, okay, of, of yeah. Olympic. My question here mm -hmm. is, has the Olympic Committee or anybody associated with the Olympics, they must have taken some notice and done something to prevent reoccurrences. 
My question is, what the hell did they do? One of my friends, a major in the Marines, Tom Hastings, was one of the people who saw the inside of this kind of change. And uh, in a minute, Aaron can comment because he probably knows uh, dozens of of Tom Hastings, but he was one of many who did uh, a foreign deployment for uh, one of the games. And the dramatic uh, effects of 72 were that defenses were ramped up dramatically. So, so that helps explain uh, uh, your question. There isn't a pattern of savage attacks on the Olympics because the defenses have been so much improved and the expenditures have been there. The, the routine now is for governments all over the world who are specialists in security to go to the site even a year or two in advance, be involved in planning groups and very expensive and elaborate preparations for all aspects of security for the games. And that's why the cost is one or two billion in some of the modern games. And it's so bad, in fact, that some, some cities are now disdaining from offering a games chiefly because of the security costs, as well as the other problems that, that occur. Um, and just extending on the intelligence piece, which I, I didn't mention, you know, the fact that, you know, CIA set up this, you know, weekly intelligence bulletin started, there were started being more analysts. Today, we have the National Counter, the Counter um, Terrorism Center, um, and they work with our international allies, as do the rest of the IC. And when Olympics come along, there are joint and combined intelligence centers that, you know, are looking for specific threats to the Olympics. So that's a key piece. They're looking for warning for anything that could happen ahead of time as opposed to after the fact. So you're not reading about it in the PDB the next day. Um, yes. I just want to find something Dr. Tierney said. Um, you had mentioned earlier on that this event this year has not gotten a lot of coverage. And there, there's events that are impacted because of the pure scale of them, and then there's events that are impacted because of the symbolist nature of it, and this, this is probably one that falls more than the symbol. Uh, what is, just to kind of bring it to today, why, why do you feel it's not covered so much? And what does that do uh, to either advantages or disadvantages? Do you think that anybody's tracking um, our paying attention to it or not, even though it's so much later? A lot of these cultures are very keen on keeping things alive, especially the symbolic events. Um, I, I'm un, unsure why there's been so little coverage. Uh, I have been at surprised. least here in the U.S. Yeah, there are probably some other countries that are doing more, but uh, Israel, perhaps. Our uh, we we often do a great deal with with round number anniversaries and and fifties a, a marker, and so I can't explain why there's been so little. Um, press coverage about terrorism has always struck me as a little bit erratic. It can be quite surprising. Um, I do. Um, I made only a few comments on this, and and others in the room might make some as well. I do think that there are probably some good good ways to cover terrorism rather than ill. Um, th there there must be a kind of um, uh, limit at some point on how much is covered. Uh, there must be a strong concern about allowing the microphone of the reporter to, to turn be turned into a simple broadcasting device. And that's one reason you'll see uh, journalists kind of try to parse out some of the major ideas and use very short quotations. Um, it, it opens the field to more bias that way. Um, I've seen some bad reflections of that little uh, skill there of, of, of editing and summary. On the other hand, it's the duty of the journalist to do that well, and sometimes uh, uh, they do. Uh, I think that it's a duty that's neglected um, in two ways. Two, two duties neglected commonly by journalists on this are one, to cover the uh, the, the personal lives and depredations of the terrorists. Um, we say we, we don't want to glamorize terrorism, but it's extraordinary how many of the perpetrators have backgrounds in the most terrible kinds of things or more lightweight stuff, just like petty crime, uh, gambling and such, which when mentioned kind of de-glamorize the group um, by definition. 
And much more of that could be done and should be. And I think also that uh, there should be much more focus on the victims. And so I would appreciate uh, when uh, the movie Munich comes out in about 05, I would appreciate less another interview with Abu Daud from Damascus crowing about how well it worked than that the same newspaper would cover some of those who were left as wrecked human beings because of it. One of the distinctive things about big attacks is that very often was bombs, especially the numbers of injured are far higher than the numbers dead. And the papers kind of dutifully report the numbers of dead. And the numbers of injured or crippled or permanently wrecked psychologically and physically uh, should be given more attention, I think, by <laughs> journalists. So those are two ways that one could think of it. There may be a third, which is that I think they all need reminders at times uh, that they are, and they do great work. I, I, I keep masses of newspaper clippings. It's a far more important material than, than some scholars think, I believe. But I think they need to, be, to remember when they cover these events that they are also a citizen, in our case, a citizen of a liberal democracy, and that they do have duties to the citizenry and not just to their craft as a journalist. And I have too often seen them allow their, their organs to become um, just communicators of the terrorist purpose. Um, uh, and uh, there's not a proper check. There's not enough addition to the story uh, to give to give the kind of chief, uh, the, the important context sometimes. So I think they can do better. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, after this, after this event in 72, some of them really tried. It used to be quite common to see books in libraries and stores about media policy on terrorism. I, I'm not sure why we've completely uh, not, you know, moved beyond that because I'm not sure we've got the, all the lessons figured. Aaron? Um, just real quick, um, I think part of it for this case was there only one American involved. And I, I don't want to trivialize David Berger, um, but it was large, it was an event that happened over there primarily to somebody else. And uh, so from the American aspect, um, it was horrific while it was happening because you were seeing it live, but it was, um, there were not a lot of American deaths. What I'll be interested in is on September 11th, 2051, when it's the 50th anniversary of 9-11, how do we memorialize it then? I don't know if I'll be here or not. I'd like to think I might be here, but- You'll have tenure. Um, I'll have tenure. <laughs> IWP will be here, but I'm not sure if I'll be. But whoever is here, I, I would like to see how that's memorialized and at, at its 50th anniversary. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming and for the conversation. And uh, you have a good afternoon. Thanks.